Controlling nuclear energy is a wonder of scientific creation. The amount of energy radioactive elements can give out is unbelievably huge. But like every other invention, humans' first instinct was to turn this into a means of murder. So nuclear weapons were made, powerful enough to burn entire cities and turn humans into ash and vapor. How are these weapons of mass destruction made? How do they work? Let's have a look. The story of these nuclear weapons starts long before the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Back in 1789, Martin Klaproth discovered uranium. This discovery was the first step towards the creation of a nuclear bomb. The start of the Second World War was a terrifying time for everyone, more so because this time nuclear weapons were on the table. A year before the war, German scientist Otto Hahn discovered a very interesting phenomenon. If an atom was bombarded with energy, it could be split up into two new elements. This was the first fission reaction, and the energy this splitting would give out was enormous. This gave the Germans a clear head start in the War of Weapons. When Roosevelt heard of this, he was very upset. How could he let humanity perish in the hands of the Germans? Nah, just kidding. He wanted to win the war at any cost, even if this cost was thousands and thousands of human lives. So the US assembled hundreds of scientists and physicists to work on creating a nuclear weapon in what was called the Secret Manhattan Project. Just four years into the war, this nuclear weapon was ready and just like that, thousands of humans vanished into thin air. Let's talk about the science behind this destructive ball of energy. In a nuclear fission reaction, an unstable atom is bombarded with, let's say, neutrons. These neutrons hit the atom and result in the nucleus of an atom splitting in two. The two new atoms formed will have different atomic numbers and masses, and hence different properties. Along with these atoms, more neutrons are also expelled. This splitting reaction gives off a huge amount of energy. Do you think a single nucleus splitting could generate enough energy for a bomb? Not at all. In fact, the important aspect of a nuclear fission reaction in bombs is that it's a chain reaction. The neutrons emitted after the breakdown of the parent atom then go on to bombard other atoms, which then give off more neutrons. In this way, the reaction goes on until all the parent atoms are broken. Some isotopes of atoms are naturally unstable and radioactive. These atoms can be split and used for a nuclear fission reaction. This is where uranium comes in. U-238 can be naturally found, so of course it's the first choice for raw materials. But it's useless in this natural form, and we need to convert it into its unstable form, U-235. Huge processing plants are needed for this enrichment, so if you're dreaming of creating your own bombs in your basement, you better forget about it. After the fuel has been prepared in the form of tons and tons of powder, the next step is the carrier. To carry out the nuclear fission reaction, the uranium fuel needs to be packed in a bomb. These bombs were a whole other problem. John Coster Mullen was the man who designed both the bombs dropped in Japan. Little Boy and Fat Man were nuclear bombs, but they were entirely different by design. Little Boy was a bullet-fired nuclear weapon. In such a bomb, a bullet of U-235 packed in explosives was placed at one end of the tube. On the other end of the tube was a neutron generator. When the bullet was fired, it hit the generator and nuclear fission reaction would begin. In contrast, Fat Man, the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, was an implosion bomb. In this bomb, a core of plutonium was surrounded in a sphere of uranium-235. The entire sphere was then surrounded by explosives. Multiple small explosives would create a shock wave that would compress the core and result in setting off the fission reaction. Although the bombs caused the deaths of thousands of people, they were very inefficient from a scientific point of view. The little boy was only 1.5% efficient. Only 1.5% of the fuel fissioned before the bomb exploded. Fat Man was 17% efficient. This means that fission-based nuclear bombs require a whole lot of fuel and end up being very less efficient. After the war, neither the governments nor the scientists were bothered by the type of monstrous creations they'd made. They wanted it to be even more efficient, so they turned their attention to fusion reaction instead. Fusion is another nuclear reaction that gives off huge amounts of energy. In this reaction, instead of a nucleus splitting in two, nuclei from two atoms fuse instead. This reaction is a lot harder to set off as the energy required for this fusion is huge. However, if you get past this hurdle, the results are astonishing. You see our sun as a ball of fire. In reality, the sun's surface has fusion reactions occurring at all times. Consider the impact one fission-based bomb had. Now multiply that 700 times for a fusion reaction. 
Imagine the energy on the surface of the sun. It's the same. Mind-boggling, isn't it? The effects of a nuclear weapon are terrifying. We've already seen hell on Earth when the atom bombs landed in Hiroshima and then three days later in Nagasaki. 80,000 people died in Hiroshima and more than 30,000 in Nagasaki. This wasn't all. Thousands more were injured and would later pass from burns and complications from the radiation. The primary sites of the bombs were completely vaporized for 22 miles. Even dead bodies could not be found from these sites. Even at a long distance from these sites, people were badly injured due to flying debris, heat, and intense radiation. Even today, people carry scars and malformations on their bodies due to the effects of this disastrous weapon. Nuclear radiation penetrates your body and can harm you from the inside out. It doesn't just affect your skin. Radiation damages the cells that are rapidly reproducing, such as your hair cells, your gut, and even your bone marrow. In extreme cases, even your DNA may mutate and break. Even years after you're exposed to radiation, you can develop life-threatening diseases like leukemia or cancer. From the first nuclear weapon in the early 1900s, we've come a long way with nuclear weaponry. It used to take nearly a decade to make one nuclear bomb, but now with the right equipment and funding, you can run a factory for mass producing them. In the 1980s, there were more than 70,000 active warheads. This was very concerning, because if a full-blown nuclear war began, this would end city upon city. After this, disarmament efforts were carried out, and today there are 13,000 warheads left. Even out of these, only around 3,000 to 4,000 are active. Nine countries in the world have nuclear weapons, and a few more are on the way to becoming nuclear powers. Thousands and thousands of weapons are mounted on missiles and stored in bases all over the world. The Cold War era after the Second World War saw a huge surge in nuclear weaponry from both the US and Russia. This was a means to prevent another world war from breaking out. But considering the actions of the US in the previous war, could this be even worse news? Such scale of mass destruction never deterred those in power as they continued to pile their nuclear weaponry. Around the world, almost 500 megatons of explosives have been detonated as nuclear tests. Nuclear tests are a tricky business. They're an important part of the process, but carrying a nuclear test can result in sanctions on the country. Although many countries like North Korea and Iran have faced sanctions to stop them from becoming nuclear powers, the countries have still managed to work under the shadows for this power. Being a nuclear power makes you invincible of sorts. We can only hope that no nuclear war breaks out and all these countries are responsible for their decisions, especially when it comes to nuclear weapons. That's it for today, guys. We'll see you soon with a new video. Till then, take care.